It's 1862, and the U.S. government has just received a letter confessing to an assassination. The victim, Bear's Rib, a hunk papa Lakota chief who had agreed to receive an annuity of goods from the U.S. government, at least before he was shot outside of his tent one night. We notified the Bear's Rib yearly not to receive your goods, reads the letter signed by nine hunk papa chiefs. He had no ears, and we gave him ears by killing him. We now say to you, bring us no more goods. If any of our people receive any more from you, we will give them ears as we did the bear's ribs. We also say to you that we wish you to stop the whites from traveling through our country. And if you do not stop them, we will. If your whites have no ears, we will give them ears. Now, Sitting Bull was not one of these nine chiefs. For while Bear's Rib advocated for peace, accommodation, and a middle way, Sitting Bull represented the other extreme. No treaties, no agreements. And if that meant war, let there be war. Thanks so much to the fine folks over at Cell to Singularity for helping to support today's historical tale. The assassination of Bear's Rib, or Bear's Ribs, accounts differ on his name, show the difficult position of the Lakota in the 1860s. By all accounts, Bear's Ribs didn't want to accept the annual delivery of goods the U.S. agents were pressing onto him, but he felt he had little choice. He wanted to avoid war, believing it would bring ruin, so he tried to take a middle path and was killed for it. And again, while Sitting Bull was not one of the nine chiefs who signed that letter, he definitely wasn't above giving the settlers ears. Indeed, while the U.S. Army had declared the 1862 Dakota War finished, it was by no means over for Sitting Bull. Actually, from his perspective, it had never really begun. He'd heard no declaration of war, no pronouncement that the Bluecoats were coming to avenge the deaths of settlers. Not only had the Hunk Papa not been the ones who'd attacked the settlers, in violation of the 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty, not a single Hunk Papa had been present when that treaty had been signed. A chief from another Lakota tribe had been designated as representing all Lakota and made his mark on a document after a negotiation mired in mistranslation and intentional deception. These treaties essentially laid out three items. First, it drew borders for the Plains tribes, insisting that tribes stick to their own territory rather than following the buffalo. Second, it instructed them to stop warring amongst themselves and attacking settlers. And third, in return for this, the government would keep settlers out of tribal territories, and Indian agents would distribute food and goods to those living on those agencies of reserved land. However, if a tribe violated the first two clauses, U.S. troops could legally fight them, which is how the Dakota War began. So in other words, the Dakota War began when a tribe Sitting Bull was not a part of attacked settlers in a place that he wasn't present, violating a treaty he never agreed to. And because of this, the army had attacked his camp, without warning, burning treasured belongings and killing women and children. Before then, he'd never fought any white soldiers, only other tribes. And now he refused to stop fighting just because the others had surrendered. Especially since, after several large groups of Dakota surrendered, 38 warriors were hanged in the largest mass execution in U.S. history, while other prisoners and their families died of cholera in internment camps. Perhaps partially for this reason, Sitting Bull increasingly believed any dealing with the whites would mean the death of not just the Lakota, but the whole loose political confederation the U.S. government insisted on calling the Sioux. But during the Dakota War, he'd also learned how costly fighting the Bluecoats could be. These soldiers did not carry the musket trade guns of his youth, but rather rifled mini-ball killers, and increasingly repeating rifles. Worst of all was the mountain howitzers, which the Lakota referred to as the gun that shoots twice, due to the boom of the cannon, then the burst of the exploding shell. Indeed, he witnessed their damage firsthand by bandaging a wound his uncle Fourhorns received during the Battle of Kildeer, and then he himself being shot in the hip with a pistol after a raid on an overturned wagon. The powerful war medicine of his shield, activated by a song to invoke its powers, had kept him alive. But the wound was sobering. They simply could not fight the Bluecoats head-on. So instead, he initiated a guerrilla war against forts and settler trains. See, gold deposits had been discovered in Montana, and increasingly, thousands of miners were blazing a trail through Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho territory to mine it out. These were treaty violators, illegally occupying Indian land and scaring the buffalo away with their clumsy hunts. So, when Sitting Bull's forces harried these efforts, the miners and troops accompanying them responded with deadly force and, at times, even more horrifying tactics. At one point, settlers intentionally poisoned a box of hardtack and left it partially burned, knowing it would be salvaged and brought to the village. 
A hundred people, mostly women and children, died after consuming it. And despite the fact the treaties promised the U.S. government would keep these settlers out of their territory in the first place, the United States found it politically unpalatable to use force against white citizens on behalf of Indians. So, Sitting Bull, and others like him, decided to take matters further into their own hands. In response, the U.S. Army set up a series of forts to protect the miners, which the Lakota considered another treaty violation. Though, in truth, by the 1851 treaty, the land they operated on was owned by the Crow, and the Lakota had either captured or occupied it, depending on your perspective, since then. Either way, due to these provocations, in 1866, the Oglala Lakota chief, Red Cloud, formed a coalition of Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho, and went to war on the U.S. Army. He actually quickly dealt a serious blow to the Federals that December when he lured 81 soldiers into an ambush, killing them to a man. At the time, the largest victory of Plains tribes over Federal troops. Within two years, the U.S. government, unable to fight the war and secure the construction crews of the Transcontinental Railroad, decided to settle with Red Cloud. They pulled out of the forts, and in the Second Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868, laid out the Great Sioux Reservation, containing the Powder River region that had previously belonged to the Crows, and the sacred Black Hills. One major stipulation was also that white people could not settle there without Lakota consent. But that was not enough for Sitting Bull, who to this point had been a relatively peripheral figure in the war. Red Cloud could do as he wished, and Red Cloud would stay on the reservation for the rest of his life, but Sitting Bull disdained any accommodation. He believed that to be dependent on the U.S. government for food would only put the Lakota in their power. You are fools, he said, to make yourself slaves to a piece of fat bacon, some hardtack, and a little coffee and sugar. For his part, he would continue to follow the buffalo, and he would continue to fight the army, the settlers, and the railroad crews. For the one thing that Red Cloud had given up was the right for the United States to put a railroad straight through Lakota land. And it was in a skirmish with these railroad surveyors and the troops protecting them that Sitting Bull performed his greatest act of military valor. For years, Sitting Bull had battled rumors of cowardice. He was what was known as an old man chief now, in his 40s, and more of a holy man and political leader than the fearsome front-rank fighter of his younger days. And many of his followers, those still willing to fight, were young warriors, men who had not yet counted coup and bristled at the idea of sedentary living without proving their manhood on the hunt or in battle first. And in this environment, accusations of cowardice are dangerous. So Sitting Bull does something unbelievably brave. He strides towards the enemy, unarmed. Bullets buzz in the air around him and slap dirt clods up around his feet, though he seems unconcerned, doesn't even look at the men trying to kill him. Instead, trusting to his war medicine to keep him unharmed, he sits, begins to light his pipe, and then calls to his companions to join him. Ducking and nervous, bullets still flying past them left and right, a few come, sitting in a circle and puffing hectically at the pipe in a display of bravado. But not Sitting Bull. He nurses that tobacco, in contemplative silence, as bullets still drum around him. Then, his pipe smoke out and his companions starting to edge away, he simply knocks the burnt plug out of it and begins to clean the bowl. When he finally walks back totally unharmed, no one will ever question the old man chief's bravery again. Instead, he has created a legend that will make more men follow him straight into the jaws of the enemy, right into the little bighorn. And while we wait for that discussion next week, I know what I'll be doing. Continuing to explore our shared historical journey in the phenomenal free-to-play idol game Cell to Singularity that has been recently living in my brain completely rent-free. I'm so pumped they wanted to sponsor us. The game is just an absolute delight. Actually, it's kind of the perfect synergy between everything we love here at Extra Credits and Extra History. The TLDR is you play through the entire development of life on Earth and the vastness of our solar system. Like, literally everything from Cell to Singularity. Singularity. You start in the primary simulation, which spans everything from amino acids to humanoid colonists to the Stone Age to Martian cities. But then you get to branch out into the Mesozoic Valley simulation, where you can see dinos! Hi, dinos! Oh, bye, dinos! Mm. 
and the Beyond simulation, which covers our solar system and beyond. Plus, there's even a rotating fourth simulation they have that spans a ton of topics from things like the history of tea to philosophy to the human body and more. I love checking in and seeing what's cooking over there. And with its intuitive gameplay, gorgeous art style, and killer scientific and historical factoids for every unlock along the way, I've been playing this game nonstop for weeks, and I'm literally playing right now as Jeff and I are writing this read. Look at this. Say hi to Jeff. I found some bunnies. Let's make more bunnies. <laughs> Actually, a quick aside, we got to speak with the developers of Celta Singularity for a bit, and they were just an awesome group of folks who were passionate about science and history who also wanted to make a game that was just so much fun that you can't help but want to play it. Again, very much like what we strive for on this channel, so I was just super happy to send folks their way. You can try out Celta Singularity for free right here, and then be sure to leave it running while you check out our next video here. See, did you hear the one about Kuya Koi, Joseph Blame, Izzy Coin, Ilkner, Dominic Valenciana, Arclight Games, Angelo Valenciana, and Ahmed Ziad Turk being legendary patrons? Yeah, turns out they're the best.